Now, a quick thank you to our sponsor today, Unbounce. Digital marketing in a pandemic means that the marketplace is more noisy than ever with people spending so much time online. One way to lessen that noise and to provide more direct and personalized value for your audience is to use landing pages. Unbounce is the number one landing page platform for over 15,000 brands, including Hootsuite, World Vision, and Later Media. Marketers can build beautiful landing pages and earn up to 30% more conversions using Unbounce conversion intelligence technology, including their latest AI-powered feature, Smart Traffic. So if you'd like to learn more about using Unbounce, head over to unbounce.com and look out for more information in the follow-up email. Now onto the discussion. I'm personally super jazzed about today's discussion. One, because I'm fascinated by the impact that content can have on our consumer behaviors. Yes, I watched a lot of Mad Men. And two, because it's not every day you get four marketing and creative powerhouses in the same place to discuss best practices and trends. Today's topic is one that is incredibly broad and dynamic. And that's because of the rapid proliferation we're seeing in popular social platforms combined with the equally rapidly evolution of consumer behaviors and expectations. Also, when we think about cultural moments, what role does content play in creating those and or how have brands used data to tap into them quickly? And also when you think about creating standout content, we need to first appreciate what constitutes content today. While it might seem simple, the challenge for marketers is striking the balance between the right content that's appropriate for the right channels to appeal to a specific mindset and need. Content consists of brand assets that are read, seen, and heard, all showing up on a plethora of platforms with specific objectives, but all working towards the singular goal of winning your attention, building a perception, and becoming lifelong customers. So how do brands like Nike always nail it on the mainstream media, while disruptors like Gymshark are crushing it on social? And how did Casper go from zero to 750 million in four years? And how did Chipotle become one of the first brands to win on TikTok? With social media users flying past the 3.5 billion users mark, and the importance of your website's rank on Google SERP, content really is king. But it's not as simple as just creating more of it to win. So today we're going to discuss top performing content types, how to match channels and tactics with marketing goals, how to use data to inform and measure campaigns, and tips for creating branded content in a digital first era. So we've got a lot to discuss as you can uh, assess by that introduction. So we're going to move quickly through this to make the most of our time. So let's kick off with an introduction from each of our panelists. And I'm going to start off with Catherine to introduce herself. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Ian. How you doing? I'm so well, thanks. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'll give a quick quick introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine O'Connor. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing at La Colombe. I oversee all marketing, branding, communications, creative, as well as digital and e-commerce. <clears throat> I've been with the brand for about six years next month. And at La Colombe, if you uh, are or are not familiar with the brand, we our mission is to make people happy with coffee. And we talk a lot about liberating the cafe menu and making it mobile. So you'll hear me talk a lot about the draft latte today, which is our really our core product line right now that we've been working on for several years. Um, so that'll be fun. And pr prior to La Colombe, I was at Free People, which is a women's fashion brand, part of the Urban Outfitters group where I led brand marketing there for five years. And in both the role today at Lock Home and previously at Free People, content has been a really big focus of my role, um, using content to build brands. So I think it'll be an exciting talk today and uh, excited to be with everybody. Wonderful, thanks Catherine. And amen to your draft lattes. <laughs> They've got me through many a day. <laughs> me too. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Lloyd here from Condé Nast. Hi Lloyd. Hey, how's it going, Ian? Um, so I'm Lloyd, uh, ECD and Head of Content Development for Brand Entertainment at Condé Nast. Um, and, you know, I kind of lead up a, I, I do lead up a creative team of uh, storytellers, filmmakers, writers, directors, 
um, that really span like all our, our portfolio brands from Vogue and GQ to Wired, New Yorker and BA, Condé Nast Traveler, Architectural Digest, to name a few. Um, and what we do is work with partners to create the best video content that performs well, but also really taps into you know, the editorial insights and leverages, you know, the storytelling that's been built up over a hundred years at Connie and Ass and brings that to our audience with, uh, with clients. In addition, uh, my team does support, uh, you know, the editorial development team, as far as creating new content that is attractive for clients to sponsor. We, uh, support the podcast business and are also kind of leading development for linear OTT and then support our unscripted and network offerings. And, and uh, while it seems like a, a large breadth and scope, it really allows us to touch every avenue of storytelling in Condé Nast and be able to bring that to our partners. Uh, prior to that, I was at uh, Box Media. I was an executive producer and creative director there and helped launch the Explainer Studio. And before that, I ran my own production company and was a working screenwriter and director. Wow, Lloyd. Okay. What a remit. I can't wait to unpack some of your <laughs> thoughts on this topic and congratulations on the amazing work you and your team have, have done to date at Condé. Let's uh, introduce Jennifer here. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, uh, I'm Jen Pepper. Can you hear me? We can <laughs> here. Great. Uh, I'm Jen Pepper. I'm the director of content at Unbounce. And at Unbounce, we make the landing page builder for marketers, where you can build your highest converting pages and optimize them all without a developer. Uh, I got started in content about eight years ago, um, first by becoming a technical editor over at a huge B2B SaaS brand called Open Text. Then I worked in the video marketing space for a company called Vidyard, if you're familiar with them. And now I work at Unbounce. And in my current role, I evaluate with my team what we can prioritize strategically from blog to feature launches to brand campaigns and beyond uh, to green light initiatives with the team that are really going to help enhance uh, our business goals. Amazing, Jennifer. And we can't wait to bring your expertise in the B2B space into this conversation because it's often forgotten, but it's an enormous market and it's one that's always challenging. Uh, we can't wait to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Jennifer. And last but certainly not least, Eddie from Chobani. Hi, Eddie. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? We can see you. Can you hear me? We can hear you too. <laughs> okay, good. All right. That's what I was worried about. Um, Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Eddie. Uh, I'm the vice president of um, the Chobani brand and our marketing and media teams. Um, we take an interesting perspective of content at Chobani, which I'm excited to share. Um, we think about it from the packaging, the product, everything can be a piece of content that goes out in the world to um, communicate and interact with consumers. Um, so my current role, the, the easiest way I always to describe it is anything that you see that is Chobani external comes from someone, something within our group. So it's content, it's, it's the smallest thing from an email to the biggest product launch you see. Um, so I'm excited to share some perspective on uh, food marketing and, and the stuff from the work that we do with Catherine and team too at La Cologne. Yeah, that's just serendipity right there when we were yeah. each other before the panel. Amazing. Thank goodness for coffee and yoga. Thank you. <laughs> Eddie, thank you so much for the introduction. Catherine, I'd like to start with you at La Cologne. You, you're known for making so many delicious things and have made a statement with your draft latte, as you just alluded to. Can you speak to about how marketing and marketing intelligence specifically helps to inform your product development and ultimately your go-to-market strategies from a content standpoint? Sure, yeah. Um, in so many different ways, right? This question has a, a few different answers. I feel like there's, there's levels to it, but a little bit about the Draft Latte for those who haven't seen it, haven't heard of it. You know, it, it was the first of its kind. We launched about four years ago, um, formally. It's really been national about the last two years. And so when we launched it four years ago, first of its kind, true frothy beverage in a can. So um, we actually use nitrous oxide to get the froth that we would usually experience in a cafe in a latte or cappuccino into a can packaged and wherever you want it. So really big deal to begin with. And even to get to the product development of the, the earliest iteration of the draft latte, we used you know, a much more lo-fi type of market intelligence. But if you are familiar with any of our cafes around the country, in nearly all of them, you would walk in and there's a line around the bar, generally towards out of the door for people waiting to get their coffee. And, um, you know, 80% 
of adults in America consume coffee. So it's a really big group of people. Um, and a majority of them don't drink coffee plain black, right? A majority of them uh, drink coffee with milk or alternative milk or sugar, some sort of sweetener. Um, so even to start with how to think about what product to create to get it out into the world, because we can't invite 80% of America into our 30 cafes every day. Um, you know, we wanted to lead with a majority of people drink coffee with milk. Now, alt milk is a huge thing. A majority of people put sugar in their coffee. So that was like the initial stages of product development. Mm -hmm. Even further al along in the past year, we launched um, oat milk into our cafes and saw that within days, I mean, days and weeks, so much shift happened to towards oat milk, which I'm sure Eddie will talk about as well. Um, <laughs> whose, oat, whose oat milk do you have in your cafes, Catherine? <laughs> well, we happen to have Chobani's oat milk in the cafes. Um, so, so such a huge shift overnight, right? So tons of people going towards um, you, putting oat milk into their coffees. And we launched on bar a oat milk draft latte on tap. Saw the crazy growth of that, just like um, everybody loved it, including myself. Um, and Look, so it's we- like, it, It's like coffee crack, let's just be clear. It's amazing, right? Like if you haven't had it, you should have it. And I will get it to whoever wants it. Um, so, so, you know, then we quickly moved into product development of the oat milk draft latte in a can, three flavors. And, and that's, so that's just, you know, highest level product development. When you get a little bit down into the details of like, how do we introduce a product into the market and understand who, where to go to first, um, what's important, you know, we're, we're looking at all sorts of data to lead us to the right direction. Again, so many people in the country consume coffee ready to drink coffee is a, one of the fastest growing ready to drink categories um, in beverage. So a um, lot of opportunity there. And so we look at, you know, an overlay of the category development across the country, um, the brand development index across the country, where we're seeing these like early adopters of alt milks, where we're seeing ready to drink kind of pop on the radar. And then, you know, like layer that again with like, where's our distribution high? Where is the media available and um, kind of use all of those pieces to help inform our go-to-market strategy and our marketing strategy um, and how we support where we are in market. So um, a lot of a lot of data, of course, and, and that's kind of like all the ramp up to in parallel to, to designing a, a campaign and content that resonates with people. So yeah, I think it sounds like from that introduction, it sounds like you took advantage of a cultural movement in terms of a, a, a growth driver of alternative milks and, and were first to market with an exceptional product and then use data to then target those specific audiences. And did you focus on, on, the, on the markets where you had a physical presence and then drove the, 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 the draft latte in a can? So... In, in a lot of cases, yes, because where we have a physical presence, New York, Chicago, LA, Philadelphia are big cities that also tend to kind of adopt these, um, you know, like forward thinking products first. So um, not, you know, but, but we also did some less, so markets that we don't have cafes in like Denver, um, some markets in Florida where we saw some early adoption there too. So. Um, a little bit of a mix, but we know our dollars go further in markets where we have a retail presence. Yep. We have a hospitality team. You know, we have that working for us too. So there is some thinking in that as well. Amazing. Thanks, Catherine, for that insight. We'll get to uh, the group questions in a second. Lloyd, a large component of your responsibility, as you just alluded to, is the long-term strategy for branded content at uh, Condé Nast. And given the shift in plans, we've all experienced the last six months what are some of the biggest learnings that have impacted your strategy moving forward? Uh, you know, I think part of that strategy is strategy that was put up front before, like uh, before COVID-19. And I think that is creating, um, creating like a suite of production solves that don't rely on traditional like doc, doc follow style kind of content. So it's animation, it's voiceover animation, it's, um, you know, it's self shot, like what, how that effectively works. And so when the pandemic hit and production kind of shifted to a, to a new form of, of solution, 
we were able to pull kind of what we know we could do in production well and apply that to RFPs that were coming in or content creative that we wanted to take to clients as things that we could execute quickly in the environment that we are now. What we've seen is what that allowed us to do was take things off the shelf that generally we don't pitch as much and really find effective and successful ways to do it, which scaled well with our audience. Um, and so what we've done is we, we've kind of had like an incubator learning of this kind of new kind of production process of production solves and creative solves that weren't kind of first thought when it came to responding to creative or taking to clients that we're now applying to future thought and future creative as things open up a little more. And obviously there's a sense of optimism that will go back to being able to function with uh, like regular production and regular creative. But now we have like data behind this creative arsenal that we really didn't pull, pull trigger on before in the past that we can now use to really expand what we can offer a client knowing that it'll perform successfully with our audience. Could you give an example of, of what would have worked in that space in terms of the data that informed something that changed? Yeah. So, you know, generally when we looked at, at like travel, it was always very, very premium shot content for Condé Nast Traveler that felt like it had like a specific, like almost photographic point of view. And to, for, we had to do a kind of road trip travel series uh, that we did with Verizon and a portion of that, and it was all self shot. So what we did was we made a concerted effort to tap talent that also had photography or filmmaking skills um, that had other kind of expertises, if it's food, if it's travel, if it's beauty, and partner them with people either in their lives or in the quarantine bubble um, and guide them through the expectations of how things should be shot including the authenticity of how they approach things they shoot every day on their iPhones. Um, and that kind of bet, that kind of, uh, that kind of communication and that trust you generally in an environment pre COVID wasn't there. It would take a lot to get a client to buy into like, just yeah. trust them. They, they're going to shoot the way they shoot and that's going to be authentic and feel good, especially on a platform like Connie Nast Traveler in this environment that kind of opened up to what well, we have to do it this way. Um, and the content came out beautiful, came out really good, felt really true and authentic and is scaling into how we're doing content on Kanye Nas Traveler, social and editorial on Instagram is scaling into how we're looking at new formats for Traveler for brands moving forward. That's amazing. Great example. Thanks so much, Lloyd. Eddie, uh, I'd like to move on to a question for you. Consumers today are more discerning than ever before. I think uh, all of us on this panel uh, represent that, obviously. I am very discerning. And for a consumer package good uh, like Greek yogurt, marketed to typically health conscious consumers, transparency and authenticity are essential. How do you and the Chobani team strike the balance between telling a product story and a purpose story, which Chobani is very well known for? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think um, as Chobani has grown over the last, I'd say, three, four years into five different categories. So we now operate in functional beverage. We have a kombucha. We have an oat milk. We have a dairy-free yogurt. We have our traditional Greek yogurt. Um, we really, I think the best principle I can put in place around like how you balance between a, a purpose story and a product story is you have to be consistent in both. Um, and we've done that very well at Chobani. So you'll never see us. I think what you notice sometimes are direct to consumer brands that show up in subways or show up in billboards that, um, you love the product, but you have no idea who the company is and you don't know what they stand for. And you, you don't know what their story is and why they exist. And then maybe you see or hear about companies where you love their story, but you've never bought their product or you've never had the chance to, to, it's never accessible enough to you. And I think where Chobani's balance comes in and how we balance that product and that purpose story is our purpose is better food for more people. And so we create products that tell that story. So we create accessibility to good food. We create better opportunities for our communities and for the world and, and the places that we operate. Um, and we do that in service of the food that we make. So for us, the consistency is the most important thing where we can balance that story between purpose and product because without our purpose, we wouldn't have our products. And without selling our products, we couldn't be the purpose-driven company that we are today. So in keeping those things in balance and those always in mind, we find that as long as we're consistent in both and we stay true to our values and our mission of being purpose-led as a, as a better food for more people, all of the products that we make and the way we make and the way we tell those stories is very authentic. 
Um, I'll give you a great example from uh, this most recent summer. Um, we all know there's a, a national food crisis happening and it's only getting a lot more apparent during um, the needs and, and the changes of our economy in this country. And so Chobani, in a very quick period of time, we decided to launch a product where 100% of the proceeds would go to Feeding America. And we were able to get it on shelf and sell it in. Wow. And it was, it was a hit and we made the food and it was, we made the packaging and it was out there. It's one of those great things where that's a product story. We're talking about this new flavor and this great product and this healthy, nutritious yogurt that you can go buy, but it's driven by our purpose and who we are as a company. Um, and so I always, I always tell the team and I always tell people that um, uh, sort of ask about the purpose and product is you, you have to balance both um, because you'll never have one without the other successfully. Amazing. Eddie, that's a, a great overview. And your founder, Hamdi, is so inspirational. I think everything he believes in is, is true throughout the company and the brand. And you guys always deliver on, on giving back, which is what consumers today expect. And it comes through loud and clear through your content. Uh, incredible stuff. Thanks so much, Eddie. We look forward to unpacking a little bit more in terms of those topics. Jennifer, finally, marketing today isn't just about building brands through amazing content. It's also closely measured by its impact on growth. So agile content, which is a lot of what we're talking about today, matched with the right delivery tools is the name of the game. How do brands think about new ways to deliver the right content to the right audience at the right time with the, fast, with the greatest chance of converting uh, that individual into a customer? Um, so for campaign delivery, I'm so glad that you asked about this. Uh, it's a classic challenge in the marketing space, right content, right person, right place. Um, and I might be biased, but outside of refining your audience targeting with things like your Facebook lookalike audiences and tweaking in ad platforms to make sure you're bidding on the right terms and things like that. I actually think that marketers have this huge opportunity ahead to embrace and think about how artificial intelligence can help you deliver content. And I was a skeptic of this myself because I thought, mm, that sounds too futuristic, that's nothing. Um, and it can seem too far off like WALL-E or C3PO type stuff. But where you used to be confined to testing this versus that or a split test where you're sending traffic to a landing page that um, it's basically equally weighted in all cases, we have now developed things like smart traffic where instead of fiddling around with your ad platforms, you can, you can create tons and tons of different variants of your campaign message um, intended to um, strike the right tone with different portions of your audience. And it's not about you making those decisions anymore. You can actually hand that over to machine learning, which I think is really exciting because it does feel futuristic, but it's basically this giant easy button. So you create all of your uh, campaigns and you try and think about like what people want to see or what will convert them, but you don't have to make the choice, right? You direct the traffic, you hit the easy button and the machine actually learns from um, who is converting on these pages. So if Ian, you know, you're converting on mobile with these attributes, it's going to find other investors yeah. and understand to serve up that uh, personalized content to them. So it takes out the effort from a marketer's point of view. And what we're seeing with customers is that you actually convert mathematically an average of like 30% more by leaving this up to essentially a robot that can make split decisions about routing way faster than a human can. So it's kind of unbelievable that it's like available and that you can do it. Um, but it's also a competitive advantage because it's so new that your competitors likely aren't routing traffic like that or thinking about campaigns like that. So I think it's kind of cool. That's amazing. I mean, A-B testing isn't necessarily new or novel, but the ability to do it at a greater scale and even faster takes agile content to a whole new level where especially with so many high level themes across the world right now, you want to make sure you're not crossing any lines and you want to make sure you're saying the right thing and that's aligned with your brand. So that's really interesting. And it'll be wonderful to see this come to life and actually work for both the customer at the end of the day so that they're making the right decisions. That's ultimately what we want to see. And then brands winning from that. Amazing. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Let's get into some panel questions and I'm going to go back to gallery view because it's wonderful to see everyone. Uh, Catherine and Jennifer, if you guys don't mind building on this question, uh, tell us a little bit about your content mix and your planning process. Uh, how often do you revisit the strategy or do one-off pieces? What's that balance? Sure, I'll uh, kick off and I'll throw it over to Jennifer. But 
Um, yeah, the content, content mix is a, a constantly evolving process. Um, and for us uh, at Lock Home with the Draft Latte, because we're, it's, we're, you know, we're still in early phases of a, pro of a product launch and of a category development. So when we, we think about um, a lot about product and a lot about um, how we can how we can continue to kind of like upend the category and make make it known that you know there's better options out there. So you know historically it's just like the sugary, watery kind of like a little bit of caffeine in a bottle, and we've totally changed that. So as a disruptor brand and kind of in this disruption phase of like high growth, we're we're focused on product education, product introduction, and so our content mix, especially on the paid side, is really going to. Um, lean heavily into like taste appeal, you know, like you want to see what the beverage looks like in a clear glass. You want to just like see the milk and coffee mixing together and kind of just like get that mouth watering taste appeal. So a lot of our content um, on the, on the product side, especially on the paid media side, will will lean in that direction. When we get into a bit more of the organic side we can we can think a bit more about um, lifestyle, aspirational imagery, things that we we want to we want to develop to connect with people. Because this other huge part about coffee is that it's a connection beverage, right? Like people meet for coffee, they go meet in a cafe. They there's just like a lot of communication that happens over a cup of coffee. So we can lean heavier into that moment and that connection. When we when we think about organic kind of aspirational lifestyle content, so that's that's like you know two lanes that we think about in developing content mix, and then in terms of flexibility in the plan and you know um, kind of reacting to a moment, we we constantly we're constantly revisiting it. I would say like on a on a really well planned out basis we're we're you know three six months planned but really on a monthly basis we're diving into the daily next month how did the next 30 days look does it still sit does it still mm -hmm. resonate has something happened that we need to react to especially the past six seven months have shown us there's a lot to react to so um so we are always revisiting and and it is it has to be flexible in that sense but that's kind of overall how we think about the mix and how we approach it Jennifer. Yeah. So as an 11 year old business, our content mix changes kind of annually based on business need. Uh, so we choose quarterly objectives that our marketing is going to focus on or the direction that we want to go. And then our content is kind of derived from those objectives, right? So for planning, our team kind of creates a matrix of content gaps. I call it content bingo. <laughs> and we take a look at like for our different profi profiles or audience members, do we have a customer story here? What do we need at the top of the funnel? What do we need in terms of evaluation style content for these people? Um, so we take a look at that um, and where we need to create in certain areas versus maybe the most sexy things, you know, like everybody wants a branded show, everybody wants a podcast, but really making sure you have that foundation set from the start is really important. Right now, our mix is, um, comes down to a couple things like, Search optimized blog posts are huge for us because we want to make sure we're attracting the right organic traffic that already has high purchase intent. Um, we release original research. So I love what Andy Crestedina says, like be the stat that doesn't exist in your industry and in B2B SaaS, you really can. So this is things like our conversion benchmark report where we use proprietary data to be able to surface to marketers how they should be converting in different industries based on what we actually see with our customers. So it kind of gives you those benchmarks. We also create long form or big rock type resources. We call them the turkeys and we chop them up into turkey sandwiches all year long. So it's kind of like things that can be reused, but they start really, really big. Um, we also have really focused on utility based marketing or tool based marketing more recently. So how can we develop a tool for marketers, something like our recent um, copy analyzer, where you can plug in a URL of a landing page and we'll tell you, you know, here's seven things that you should do maybe differently. Uh, so tools that people can use is kind of how we think about that. I mentioned like we do customer stories and these can show up in text or video and like 
how do you slice and dice that? Have like a 20 second video, a one minute 50 video, just different lengths. Yeah. And now we're just really focused on going beyond the blog and beyond text base to be able to show up in people's feeds, like where they're paying attention or where they're, you know, hopefully not doom scrolling these days, but you know, we're more likely to show up there now or try multimedia and podcasts. Amazing. Great answers. Thank you both. Uh, I'm super excited now to welcome one of our alumni at BrainStation, Nikki, who's going to join the panel to ask a question. Uh, Nikki, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, my name is Nikki. I'm a recent graduate from BrainStation's Digital Marketing Diploma course. And yeah, my question will be, what emerging channels have you experimented with recently? And what were the results, like for example, TikTok, Twitch, Thriller, or SMS marketing? Um, Lloyd, do you want to take that one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah sure, sure. Uh, yeah, you know, it's because there are emerging platforms. On as far as partnerships with clients, we've just started experimenting on what would work for the client there, because I think a lot of our clients are also kind of experimenting in that uh, in that space. But what we've done is look at where editorial teams, where they take a lot of uh, a lot of um, kind of bets in those spaces first, and get the data from them, and see what works for them. So we can obviously mm -hmm. the best way to work in branded content with publishers take our data from editorial and apply that to how we work with the brand. And and you know, in the sense of TikTok, um, Self has been incredibly successful in what they're doing there. I mean, they've essentially um, created a whole kind of brand voice on TikTok. Their approach to sexual education to youth and how they talk about it there is is incredible. And what they've done is applied an authentic voice, uh, an editor that's with them, a younger editor, and use stop motion and self shot and simple, very simple but very approachable animation to tell very deep kind of stories on a platform that you don't expect that um, to give information to that audience, that Gen Z audience that look that's looking for sexual health education in a fun way that a lot of them feel uncomfortable getting in their schools or asking their parents about. So they've become, they've created an audience that considers self an authority on this. And that audience will translate as they get older as self being a place to come for health and for conditions and to have those conversations about body and mind. Um, and so we're looking to do that with all our brands and, and that's how, as they're successful, it's how we will translate that data into what we're doing with our brand partnerships, bringing that success and that data to them and saying, this is, this is the audience we've cultivated on these emerging platforms. This is how we want to bring you in in partnership to talk to that audience. Um, you know, with Twitch, we're launching Wired Gaming very soon, and we're going to have something with them as well, and, and we'll really build something around there. And I think, you know, it's not an emerging platform. It's a platform that exists, but uh, linear and OTT is something that's not necessarily, it's, it's not like a social platform. It's not de rigueur, but it exists, but it's not something that's really been taken advantage of in the past. And, you know, Verizon just released something that said like, um, you know, ad supported video on OTT and linear will be, will be like double the revenue in the next three years. And we made a concerted effort of looking at that. We've launched a BA channel on linear OTT. We have, we have uh, theme channels on like Pluto. We have a uh, Vizio has our BA channel and we've already started bringing partners into playing in that space. Last year we developed a very TV like cooking competition show at Campbell's that was on our BAOTT that was received very well. Uh, we're working with other partners on certain things on, on our OTT and we've now on my team dedicated a specific role to that that sits hand in hand with our unscripted and network television development team to pull really big concepts to bring to our advertisers and with our you know tune in like tune in the experience that we have in CNE for our own IP apply that tune in strategy to content we create with an advertiser that's long form. So mm -hmm. you can actually direct eyeballs to this huge content utilizing all our platforms. That's amazing. Thank you for the great question, Nikki. And I think it's also interesting to know just how the utility of different cha channels and platforms changes over time. It, like TikTok at one point entertainment will soon become more of a purpose driven platform too. Facebook's evolved over time, Instagram will evolve. And even new platforms will emerge, uh, like you just alluded to, Lloyd. Eddie, I'd love you to tackle this one with perhaps Catherine and Lloyd commenting, but how do you decide whether a channel actually makes sense for your brand? Yeah, it's a good question because it's a debate we have every day. <laughs> and I think we have to balance wanting to be 
innovative and creative and, and disruptive with obviously commercial goals and what we want to do for our business. Uh, so on our side, you know, we, we were fortunate at our company. We're young. We're under 15 years old. We are, we're in a growth phase of, of our trajectory. Um, we get to experiment a lot. And so we're really excited about that. If we want to try something, we don't, we don't become too precious about it. We push it into the channel and we see what happens. Like we just did our first, um, TikTok. We just did our first TikTok program and we're like crossing our fingers. We're like, we're hoping it's still here in six months. We have no idea, but we'll see what happens. Um, just to try it. And I think for, for us at Trabani, the way that we think about trial and error and these types of, these different types of programs are, we imagine a world or we look at the program and we say, if we didn't do this, would we be upset? If we didn't do this, would we uh, regret it? If we didn't do this, um, do we expect anything else to change or something not to change? And so when we put it in that context of, do we expect something to happen? What do we expect to happen? Would anything change if we did this or didn't do it? It actually takes the channel discussion out of it. And we don't have to worry so much about where it's going or how it's being communicated, but we just worry about what the impact is or what we expect to happen. And then if we, expect good things to happen, we try it. It doesn't matter. Um, and so for like, I'll give you the TikTok example, the, the idea of we have a new product, we wanted it out there. We felt like it was a great way to get it in front of people. Lots of eyeballs, obviously. Is it super measurable? Not yet. Um, but we said, if we didn't do this, we could be missing out on hundreds of thousands of people of seeing this new product. And we're like, well, we want that. So let's try it. <laughs> um, so we, we don't look at it so much as like, we don't evaluate the channel necessarily. So, so, um, discreetly on like can you measure it audience those pieces we look at it as what would you miss out on or what would you what do you expect to happen and do you really think it's going to happen doing this strategy if the group the people working on it have a consensus of yes then we try it amazing thanks eddie great insight there um moving on to this question i'd like Catherine to focus on the answer here in thinking about the core metrics you look at when evaluating your campaigns how has this evolved over the last few years from your time at Free People to La Colombe? And how do you see it evolving over the next year? Yeah, I was so hoping this question was going to go to Eddie. I wanted him to answer this one. <laughs> I, got, I don't want to answer this one. You can answer it. <laughs> Eddie and I actually work together like over the past six months fairly frequently. And I, I tap him for like my own questions, especially when it comes to media, because He's got years of experience, um, especially working with paid media. So, so I'm going to bounce part of this over to him, but I will I tackle it first. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, thinking about core metrics, thinking about the difference between um, free people and La Cologne, which is, is, is really big, um, you know, uh, actually though converging a bit more now because at free people largely digital focused really e-com driven um, obviously tons of stores but like in terms of where the business was at that time it was all about growing the e-commerce channel growing mobile and so thinking about um, you know how we were driving um, acquisition of new customers onto the site and um, and so at La Colombe now, because of since COVID, our e-com business has skyrocketed. You know, uh, two of our other channels are, are suffering, cafes and our hospitality channel, which is like restaurants, cafes, hotels. Um, and then our CPG channel in retail is also doing really, really well. So huge shift, right? Like a year ago, we would have been saying, we're thinking about out of home, we're thinking about... Um, you know, podcasts, we're thinking about things where just differently, whereas now we're thinking about e -com a lot. And so we're thinking about similar things that I would have thought about in my previous life, social advertising, return on ad spend, reach impressions, frequency of, um, of those impressions. And so, you know, we, we drive our, our content to, to meet those metrics. We want to just constantly be, be, um, optimizing our campaigns to be reaching either just the most amount of people when we're introducing a new product or if we're still just doing brand building or if we're driving to conversion, then we're thinking about, you know, frequency return on ad spend and, um, and just really navigating it that way. So really interesting question. A um, lot of things to pay attention to data wise and, and kind of overall performance of campaigns. Eddie, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll give, I'll give an example. This is actually very relevant because we actually worked on a project not too long ago where this came up. 
Um, so in seeing e-com grow and this idea of bringing this coffee culture to their kitchen countertops, which La Colombe, I mean, my fridge is stocked with La Colombe every single time and the good, the beans, everything is great. Um, the, we realized, we said, hey, we can't actually approach La Colombe. We said, hey, we have a lot of oat milk that we think would go really well with bundles in your merchandising and your products. Um, can we put them together and can we ship them to consumers and Chobani will take on building the demand for those bundles for your consumers. And we had a really fun go about this content strategy because we had to balance between introducing people to our new product like Chobani Oat, along with coffee culture of La Colombe and the products that they have in the middle of a pandemic, trying to find the most efficient way to spend the media dollars, but also do it in a way that wasn't, you know, so performance focused, you lost the magic of coffee at home with your two favorite brands or what I would argue are your two favorite brands. Um, so we had some really, we had some really good fun learning um, about search, about retargeting, about the role of paid social and how all of that can help drive a qualified conversion that you want to see and not worry so much about just the site traffic or just the ROI or just the individual metrics. But as Catherine's saying, there's so much to consider. We are really focused on, we want to qualify people that love coffee, that love these brands, that want to try them together to shop on Um, So we had this really fun test project over the summer that um, we definitely picked up on the trend with La Colombe that people were wanting coffee at home and they wanted that same experience and they wanted to get it um, safely. And so we had a great uh, merchandising and product bundle that we launched. I don't know if it's still there, but if you want it, go get it. <laughs> That's awesome. And just for those tuning in, it is serendipity that these two work together. This was not the plan. It's amazing that they're able to bounce off each other. Uh, that's awesome insight. And I think partnership marketing is, is such a, an important component to any brand uh, when you're trying to tap into your respective segments and audiences. Uh, now, I'm going to introduce another alumni of ours, Crystal, to the panel to ask her question. Crystal, just want to check that you're there. Hi, I was uh, wondering if uh, you can, Jennifer, you can share some tips to how you uh, repurpose content on the different platforms that you use this. Crystal, this is a great question. As I say, cut that turkey up, make turkey sandwiches. <laughs> um, I loved that some insights that someone shared with me on this recently. Um, they put it that first you look at the big piece of content that you're trying to repurpose and look for themes, right? Look throughout that big piece and pull out the themes, right? And then I like to say, go through with your highlighter, right? And around those themes, highlight need to know information from those themes. Um, and then try slice and dice by industry, right? So if you have things that apply to different industries, slice and dice that way. Slice and dice by your target segments, which might differ from the industries that you've covered. Um, I love when people can compare and contrast information. So sometimes great angles are, this is this way over here, but it's this way over here. Um, so think about opposites or contrasts. Um, do roundups of like top three, top five, top 10. This is like a media format in entertainment for a reason. So I think B2B SaaS companies or other companies can just steal it. Um, and also look at YouTube like a search engine. I think a lot of people forget that you have content that can be sliced and diced for how-to uh, phrases, like how to install a kitchen sink, right? Or if you're Home Depot, definitely show up for that. <laughs> but how can you make short, short um, pieces of content based on your big pieces and those themes um, for repurposing? But I hope that kind of- That's great. That, that was really specific. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I do move quickly because I want to get as much out of you guys as possible. Uh, next question, I'd like to have uh, Catherine actually take a stab at it first, but for, and, and then followed by Lloyd, perhaps. Uh, a lot of people tuning in might have smaller marketing budgets. They might not be the big brands. What are some effective but low-cost content tools or tips they should consider when planning their campaigns? Yes. I feel like I've lived in the world of small budgets for many years. <laughs> um, um, so low, so you said low, low cost tips and content ideas. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this is where social comes into a, the huge, huge piece of it because it can be, um, you know, it's fast, it's measurable, it's low cost, um, it's very targeted and, um, 
you know, that is, that is probably the number one tip. And the number one thing I would, I would advise is to be looking at channel specific things that you can really, when you have a small budget and you need that budget to work and you need to show performance for that budget, then generally, you know, when, when I, when I look at even a couple years ago, even last year, when I look at the total pie and I ha- and I know I have to be, I'm accountable for driving certain volume, then, you know, I'm saying how much of this budget has to be dedicated towards what I can measure. And so, and then what can I measure? And that's going to be like either tran- almost transaction-based marketing tools in retail when I think about like the CPG channel. So things that, um, you know, that help track that you saw an ad or you saw a coupon and you converted on it or in the social channel, specifically when thinking about um, DTC and e-commerce, I, you know, I know that they're going to get a branded content experience, which is really important as a brand marketer as we're building our brand. And I can also measure the results and the performance of it. So um, it is, you know, it's a really important channel for us. And, and definitely you want to think about your content mix very aligned with your performance um, and how it can be measured. Lloyd, <laughs> more fun answer maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I think there's there's a few ways to do it. W- one way, one way is, is you know repurposing assets. You know, what we've done a lot is is taking client assets and 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 recutting them, re-editing them with like our editors that cut our our editorial video content. Um, so it has like more of a point of view um, to create like custom assets that run across that editorial content. Like an example of that is. We have a show on AD called Every Detail that goes into every detail of an architectural space. We did something with BMW where they just wanted something quick turnaround, gave us all their video assets that were shot around their car. And we did like a custom, you know, pre-roll element of every detail BMW 3 Series that went through every detail of the car as as pulled from assets that they, that they had. So every detail of the interior, every detail of the exterior, every detail of the aerodynamics. And it all came together with everything that we had and came together very quickly. Um, another way is obviously, you know, running a network uh, of, of channels is um, product placement. So finding shows that we already have programmed and finding ways to put product placement within those shows. Mm-hmm. We also have like an offshoot of that, which is the custom pre-roll because we own all the ad inventory around our, our YouTube channels and our YouTube content we can take the talent or the location that we're shooting in and shoot very quickly in like an hour, a custom piece of pre-roll that is relevant to the content. So it runs before that content. So your audience is bought in immediately from the beginning and then has awareness that 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 client is placed or is in this piece of content that is coming up, which increases like the awareness and affinity for that product in the episode that they're watching. Um, you know, and then another way that, you know, we're just kind of kicking off, I think is very effective is podcasting. Um, if you can come up and partner with a good podcast idea right away, it's very easy to get it off the ground and fit it into our programming slate. And then video offshoots of that really are, you know, we don't want to look at it as just putting a camera in the room of two people talking, but we're experimenting, like, how does a brand take the, the VO and, and the voice that's captured in a podcast? And how is that represented in the video? And as an example, let's say, if we had a podcast partner with someone with The New Yorker, you know, it's like, how do we take the best sound bites and animate them in a New Yorker cartoon style and let that live on social on The New Yorker on O&O? So an audience that's just looking for video and not aware of this podcast are finding these really, like, snackable, enjoyable sound bites and are driven back to the podcast to download in the lesson. Great advice. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Eddie, I'd like you to uh, answer this question. It's one that uh, I, I alluded to at the beginning in the introduction, which is this balance between taking a, a, a cultural moment and running with it and, and winning as a brand versus a brand trying to create one. Uh, l- looking at your experience as a marketer, what are your thoughts on finding that balance? How often do you take a cultural moment and run with it? Or how often are you trying to create cultural moments with your time? Oh, I'm the worst person to ask this. I, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in, uh, in what you call like cultural marketing with like award shows and tent poles and these big events that people think are culture and they're really not. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it, I'll say this from my perspective, not necessarily from Trevani's perspective. Yeah. Um, 
the, the world and, and the way that we all have experienced it is always changing and has ever accelerated so much even this year. And to me, and I had this discussion with um, my team recently too, to me, we have to take the blinders off of what culture means to us. Too often culture becomes these tentpole events. They become these, these mass these mass productions of things that the news is talking about or that press is talking about. And then I'll, I'll use an example like TikTok, for example. Like yeah, I spend hours, unfortunately, sometimes on that thing and just fall into it. And I see the creativity and I see the trends. And then I'm like, why? I listen to my Spotify top 10, top 100 songs. I'm like, I don't know any of these. And then I'm like, oh, because they all came from TikTok. And this now is what is happening in the world. Um, and so I think cultural marketing or the idea of cultural marketing, it's important because really what you're saying is you want to be relevant. You want to be, you want to be adapting your brand and your message to what's happening in the world. So you don't fall off sort of, you know, the horse and fall off in, in good graces with consumers. Um, but what is culture and what that means is different for everybody and different for every brand. And I'm glad like Lloyd brought up podcasts and like we've been dabbling and I'm actually Catherine, I meant to tell you this, I was going to text you this the other day. Like we've been dabbling in audio as like a low cost option and it's great content and it's working really well for us. Um, we, to me, like that's culture. Like people are in their kitchens cooking and they're listening to podcasts to kill the time. And that's, that culture is what's happening now. It's what, it's what's happening in six months. Um, and so I, yeah, I'm, I'm not in the camp of like, do the Grammys, do the Oscars, do the VMAs. Those, like, those are big moments in culture, absolutely. And they're big tent poles for brands and big tent poles for companies. Um, but for me, I think culture becomes way more fun when you start to start to look at, well, why is this happening over there? And where is it coming from? And who's the group or who's the sub sub group or who's the, the tribe, the community that's creating it? Learn about them. And if it makes sense for your brand or what you do, figure it out. And if not, just pay attention to something like really cool. Like just get, like me watch hundreds of hours of TikTok videos and then be like, this is cool, but <laughs> not for yogurt. You, you, and millions, <laughs> yeah. uh, you and millions others. Uh, okay, guys, we're going we're gonna to run through a few questions here in rapid fire with the minutes that we have left. Uh, there is a great question here that uh, was talking about localization efforts for presenting dynamic content for multilingual and multilocation initiatives. Uh, a lot of you are targeting consumers in, in, in different geographies uh, with different languages. How do you tackle that in an agile fashion? Who wants to pick that one up? Lloyd. I'll, I'll start. I mean, just because we, we, are, we are a global company, so we, 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 and we do work with some, some global brands. A lot of our, you know, from our U.S. revenue perspective and who we're talking to is for the domestic market, but a lot of times the content works so well or looks, uh, looks so good that, the uh, the brand will want to scale it out to res like local markets, especially um, when it comes to our travel content. If it's a travel advertiser and we're shooting around the world, while it's targeting U.S. markets, sometimes that content can be relevant for other markets to get them to travel there. Um, so it really is, you know, we have a, a process within our production process that is, you know, um, both like on a legal standpoint and cultural standpoint, understanding what will play and what won't play uh, in certain markets so we can adjust what the content might be. Like what, what works here might not work in EMEA, might not work in the Asian markets. It's also looking at like where this content is go going to live. Like, uh, you know, we create, we did a campaign where it was all around the world and we did Facebook cuts. There is no Facebook in China. So we had to figure out like, what is like the WeChat version of what we're doing? What does that audience consume for this kind of content? Awesome, great answer, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so question here from Nicole, what AI tech are you using, Jennifer? Sure, so the AI tech that we're using is smart traffic. So this is, we've basically been able to train a machine learning model, which was proprietary and in-house. It's pretty cool. Oh, wow. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. So you, you're you literally at the cutting edge of that. That's awesome. We hope so. Um, okay. Question here from, let's go back up here. Uh, Anita, what do you do to advance yourself today in the marketing field? Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of upskilling in this space, especially when it comes to digital marketing, like we've spoken about a lot today? Catherine, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. So meaning like career rise, career yeah. rise what do you do to advance? Um, and this, this could also maybe tap into maybe some others could share like things they pay attention to things they read podcasts they listen to. Cause I was curious to hear others answers on that too. Sure. Um, 
Now I would say, you know, there's a lot about networking. Like I, you know, I joke about reaching out to Eddie, but I do reach out to Eddie because when I, I am very well aware of what I'm well versed in and some things I'm learning constantly. Right. And so I tap people that, you know, are good people in the industry who are willing to give a few minutes to talk about something that they have um, expertise in. And so I do it often. (laughs) Um, I use LinkedIn and I, use, you know, like just a network of people and ask people to introduce other people and kind of just tap into learning that way because it's, uh, there's so much to learn. There's, it's a never ending um, process and, you know, that's the fun part of it. So to advance, I think you just kind of have to be curious and ask a lot of questions and um, keep playing around with things really. Yeah, I would build on that kind Catherine, I was going to say, if anyone's able to find my secret TikTok, I'll send you yogurt. <laughs> you can find it. But um, I know I've been, I, that, that's been the topic of discussion of our team a lot lately. But yeah, I, I would agree. Like the best way to advance yourself is to immerse yourself in it. Like if you, if we know TikTok is a thing, but you haven't figured it out, make a TikTok, make stupid videos. I have wanted me climbing into a tub of Chobani yogurt, like from like a depth perception um there's just like silly things you can do to learn it and then it it really does inspire you or inspires me at least um uh, like I my friends when we were talking about podcasts and stuff like my friends have a podcast and so I went and watched them film it and I went and watched how they'd make it and what goes into it and the the banter they have and how that gets created and why audiences love it so I think it's it's so important to ask the questions but then it's also important to figure out a solution even if it's not for your brand or your company for yourself just figure out what you would do with that because that will inspire you then to bring it back to your company, bring it back to your career, bring it back to work that you do. Yeah. Being a creator. I think Eddie, you hit on there where like create the thing that you would want to watch yourself or that kind of thing. Um, And I would also add in for those who are interested in tech and B2B SaaS, really build skills around analyzing data. That's critical for marketers. It doesn't have to be super sophisticated, um, but I'm also seeing up opportunities for skill sets around adoption and retention right now. So when the world is experiencing, you know, very tough events, companies need people who know how to do win back campaigns, um, identifying when customers are hitting adoption metrics and when they become at risk for churn. Yeah, that's great advice. And to become a data savvy marketer is essential data and marketing has become such a technical skill in today's world that it's important you become data savvy. You also learn these platforms inside and out by becoming a creator and also learning the, the skills of measurement and creating campaigns on them. And we highly recommend the digital marketing course at BrainStation as a place to start uh, to learn about all of these platforms, all of the skills needed to, to win on them too. Anyway, we've gone two minutes over. It's been such a pleasure to have all of you as our panelists, Lloyd, Catherine, Eddie, and Jennifer. You've been amazing. Uh, Thanks to everyone who took the time out of their day to tune in. We hope you've learned a lot. We got through a lot and a recording will be coming out soon so you can rewatch all of this. And until next time, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you are. Take care.